Today's seminar is titled Alchemical Images as States of Mind, and our presenter is Dr. Murray Stein. We're also fortunate to have with us Ryan Deegan, our technician, who will be assisting in any questions that might come up and furnishing them to me so that I can present them online. Just by way of once again introducing the fact that there's a very large community of individuals, we've had well over a hundred um, individuals enrolled for this conference, of which perhaps 80 to 90 are planning to attend live. As I began to read through the names of the countries, as Dr. Buser often did, I was aware that that might take too much time from us, but suffice it to say, in this period of the Olympics, um, we're not doing bad representing a worldwide community as well. Today's presentation is 90 minutes long, and we'll ask that if you have questions, the best way to pose those questions will either be through using the chat feature that's on the bottom right-hand corner of the software platform that we're using. Likewise, feel free to send questions via email to the address you see there. You may want to write that down. It's info at AshevilleYoungCenter.org. We invite you to play around with the audio settings and make certain that things are optimized for you. You'll see that you have two primary choices. You can either listen with the microphone and speaker, and that's titled Mic Speaker. Make sure that button is activated. That's how most people will prefer to listen. Or if you prefer, you can also dial into a telephone number that will be um, furnished to you with the invitation. And you'll do that by clicking on the telephone button. Initially, everybody's microphone is muted, and we are likely to continue that so that questions will be posed either through Ryan or myself. Also, we encourage you to explore the features of full mode, full screen mode, that will allow the pres presentation and the video or slides to be enlarged. Let me just announce that we also have an upcoming seminar titled Envisioning the Internet, Discovering Psyche in the Electronic Sea. Our featured presenters will be Dr. Al Collins and Elaine Molkanov, both members of the IAAP. That seminar is planned for next Saturday, February 15th, also from 11 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And it will be live from the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. I'm required to mention that this program, as with all our programs, has no commercial support for the presenter, for the topics or the program. It also has no pharmaceutical industry support of any kind associated with the program. At the end of the presentation, you'll receive an online a request to have you complete an online survey. We ask that you do that so that we can continue to improve our, our programming. We'll be taping today's program, so if you wish to remain anonymous, we ask that you please mention that, although I'll be posing the questions along with Ryan, so unless you expressly wish for us to mention your name online, uh, we'll probably pose all questions anonymously. And one life, final thing that I wanted to um, mention, and just for a moment, I'm going to have to um, step away and see if I can share my camera. Just a moment. As part of this, um, Ryan informed us that we have a we're a town that's known for its brewing capacities. We've, in fact, been the beer capital of the, of the country two or three times. And Ryan, our technician, happened upon a, um, an interesting little detail. I'll show this, and I'll try and hold it up. It's titled Alchemy Ale. And I thought it might be good to just describe what the brewers have decided to characterize this as. And I quote, as brewers, we practice alchemy every day, said Rob Widmer, co-founder of Widmer Bro Brothers Brewing. There's a lot of ways to combine water, malt, hops, and yeast to brew a great beer. With Alchemy, we really wanted to celebrate the brewing process, turning traditional brewing ingredients into liquid gold, and we're happy with the result. I suppose with just a few word changes, that's not a, a, a terribly ill-suited description of the individuation process and how Alchemy can provide a roadmap for that. So without further ado, let me just introduce Dr. Stein who most of you know, Dr. Stein is a 
supervising and training analyst and former president of the International School of Analytical Psychology in Zurich, Switzerland, ISAP. He's the author of many books, of which one of those includes a Chiron title that we're proud of, The Principles of Individuation. Dr. Stein currently resides in Switzerland, and this is one of five, seri five seminars that are part of a series we're doing. You may have missed the introduction, and if so, we invite you to go on the website and, and visit that presentation. This is the first of a five series seminar. So, Murray, if you'll take over. Thank you, Lynn. Am I live? You are live. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, well, as, as Lynn explained, this is the first of five in this series. We did an introduction uh, in November, which uh, tried to um, inform uh, you, the audience, of the importance of um, his studies in alchemy for, for Jung and why that was uh, so important in the last uh, third of his life, from 1930 until he died in 1961. He spent a great deal of time um, with his uh, alchemical studies, and uh, three volumes of the collected works are dedicated to alchemy, and then there are some other papers in the collected works that also um, are informed by his alchemical studies. So it was a, a major feature of his entire oeuvre, uh, the alchemical studies, and um, as I tried to explain last time, uh, the reasons are very complex. Um, but uh, I think Jung felt a great kinship to the alchemists because they were engaged in a very difficult uh, process of self-discovery, of um, exploration of their own unconscious, as Jung would see it, uh, as he was in his explorations in the Red Book and uh, otherwise. And so he felt um, a kind of partnership and kinship with the alchemists. And alchemy also gave him, he felt, and his psychology, a grounding in a historical tradition. Because as a modern man, he felt cut off from traditions, no longer really a part of a religious tradition, although culturally certainly a part of the uh, Judeo-Christian tradition, the European tradition. Um, but uh, psychology, which had its birth, depth psychology had its birth at the beginning of the 20th century, late 19th century, um, he felt needed to have a connections uh, of a deep cultural nature with the past. And when he discovered alchemy, he saw it as a link to the far past, to Gnosticism, to ancient uh, practices um, in um, Greece and, and Egypt um, and medical tradition of those times. And so modern psychology, as he envisioned it, had a, a kind of continuity um, with the past through alchemy. And he saw his work as a psychoanalyst as a kind of modern version of the alchemical process of transformation. As Len said, turning the prima materia or the lead, whatever you begin with, eventually into gold, something of great value through a long process. And it's that process that he uh, wanted to elucidate by exploring um, the fantasies and the images, uh, the thoughts of the alchemists. And so in these five seminars, we'll try to see what Jung discovered. Um, we aren't going to explore alchemy per se, we're not going to look at a lot of alchemical texts. They're far too complicated and, and beyond my capacity to interpret. But I will refer to them from time to time and base these seminars really fundamentally on some passages in Jung's collected works. Uh, so for each of the seminars, there will be uh, a brief reading that I would suggest that uh, everyone who participates in this series uh, tries to um, uh, read in advance of the seminar and study carefully, and I will uh, guide my, my uh, comments and thoughts 
uh, along the lines that are in these texts and also try to help you as seminar participants to um, enter into a very difficult set of um, writings, uh, Jung's alchemical writings, that have put off many people. Many people read Jung, but when they get to the alchemy, they put it aside and just can't make too much out of it. It's not impenetrable, but it's difficult. And one has to be patient, as the alchemists were with their process, to um, find a point of entry into these texts. They are so rich, and they are so deep, and I think they do contain um, the best of Jung, of late Jung, the distilled wisdom of all his experience as a psychoanalyst, a psychologist, a doctor, and a man who lived a very rich and interesting life. So for this seminar, um, which I've entitled uh, States of Mind, if you can see my screen, I hope, there. And I will try to put this on full screen there. Um, we're going to speak about uh, alchemy as and, and the alchemical images and symbols as states of mind or using alchemical images and concepts in Jungian psychology. And this has to do with how to interpret uh, the images and concepts from alchemy in psychological language and put them to use in our work as psychotherapists or in our own lives and, and as we try to understand our, uh, our psyches, ourselves, our interactions with other people, our problems, our complexes, our development. How, do we, how can we use alchemical images and concepts to help us understand ourselves from a psychological point of view? Hey, Murray, um, if you can, try and click on the, the side seminar, the slideshow uh, at the top I and uh, run in slideshow read, mode. Uh, some pages in volume 12 of the collected works, uh, a section called Basic Concepts of Alchemy, um, which is a, a very suitable introduction uh, to uh, many of the fundamental features of, of the alchemical process. Uh, it just hits the high points, and uh, I'll kind of guide you through these passages as we go along in this seminar. What I would like to do is, um, every 10 minutes or so, take a, a pause and ask uh, if there have been any questions. And if there have, Lynn will be so kind as to select one or two uh, and try to um, create a facsimile of a, of a living, of a real life seminar so that there is some interaction and discussion going on as well as lecturing. Uh, so let me begin um, by just putting up here again um, a list of Jung's writings in alchemy. Um, which I went over with you last time uh, in the introduction, but I want to put this up for your review uh, so as to situate ourselves within uh, the body of Jung's work that extends from roughly 1900 when he began his uh, professional career as a psychiatrist until 1961 when he passed away. And you see that these writings on alchemy begin uh, 1929 and extend through uh, 19, the 1950s, 1954, basically his last great work in alchemy, Mysterium Canutionis. And so the bulk of these works were created in the 1930s and the 1940s. And it began, as you recall, uh, with um, his uh, surprising discovery of um, uh, uh, with the help of Richard Wilhelm of uh, Chinese alchemy. Uh, when Richard Wilhelm sent him a translation of a Chinese uh, alchemical text called The Secret of the Golden Flower and asked Jung, invited Jung to write a commentary, a psychological commentary on that. And Jung became so fascinated by it that he spent much more time and energy than he ever thought he would at the beginning, got caught by it and realized a very significant factor, significant for him, and that was that the process that these Chinese alchemists were describing as they um, uh, 
uh, laid out their practices and their disciplines and the and what they found in their spiritual development uh, so uh, in a kind of eerie and um, heimlich, unheimlich, uh, 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 uncanny way resembled his own experience as he had been uh, delving into his individuation process since the beginning of the Red Book period in 1913, um, that the, the patterns of development uh, were similar. And so, he, as he says in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, this text uh, showed him that his experience wasn't so idiosyncratic, culturally unique or limited, but that it had a general universal human significance. And from that, he suddenly leapt to the conclusion, aha, the individuation process is archetypal and alchemy is uh, a, a key resource for discovering how uh, people in pre-modern times um, um, imagined and, and experienced uh, the individuation process in their own way, in a pre-psychological, mythological, if you will, um, certainly not in a modern way. Um, and so uh, after uh, writing this commentary on the Secret of the Golden Flower in 1929, he began buying alchemy books from a bookseller in Europe and in Munich and uh, at first was rather put off and then began studying in earnest and began publishing, writing uh, some of the results of his research in relation to various other topics as um, this list indicates. And a number of these um, uh, works that are on this list that you see beginning in 1936, Individual, individual Dream Symbolism in re Relation to Alchemy, which we will look at in uh, seminar number one, two, three, four, um, actually it'd be number three, the next, the one after this coming one, we will look at part two of, uh, psycholo of uh, Psychology and Alchemy, uh, where Jung writes about um, a dream series in relation to um, alchemy. Um, then uh, that paper was originally presented at the Aronos Conference in 1936, 1937. He presented another paper at the Aronos Conference called Religious Ideas and Alchemy. And that became part three of uh, volume 12, The Collected Works. And that's what we're reading from today. Um, uh, and the, um, the context of Aronos was very important to him because, um, as you may know, uh, it was a gathering of world-class scholars who um, came from different disciplines, um, history of religions mostly, um, and it was an attempt to uh, instill a dialogue between East and West, Eastern ideas and Western ideas. Um, and Jung was the psychologist in the group. And he um, found this group very compatible and um, uh, receptive to his ideas. And so a dialogue developed between psychology and religious studies uh, from many directions, um, Hinduism, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, uh, Greek religion, Egyptian, all kinds of angles and directions. Um, and uh, Jung's contribution was the depth psychological one that uh, many of the others uh, began to borrow in their investigations of their own uh, specialist areas. Uh, and that's where he presented a number of these papers uh, related to alchemy. Um, including the one that we are uh, considering today. And then as you see from this list, his um, works go on and into the 1940s and finally culminate in 1954 with the great work Mysterian Conjunctionis, which we will not be able to consider in this seminar in any detail, but I will mention it from time to time. And um, 
side by side with him throughout much of this period was uh, Maria Louise. Sora Mystica, uh, a um, companion in these um, um, investigations into alchemy, uh, Dr. von Franz uh, actually received her uh, scholarly training at the University of Zurich and um, earned a, a, a doctorate in medieval studies, medieval Latin, uh, and was um, absolutely fluent in and uh, the literature of the Middle Ages, um, conversant with all of it, and uh, really a very well-trained scholar. So her writings on alchemy, which I will mention also from time to time, uh, do give a probably a more scholarly perspective on uh, alchemy than Jung's do, um, in that she is a trained uh, medievalist and uh, <clears throat> as the uh, discipline of the scholar. Jung was trained as a physician, a doctor, and didn't have that kind of uh, very rigorous uh, scholarly training that von Franz had. Uh, and she did a lot of um, research for him and uncovered texts and translated them, helped him translate and, and put together a lot of his ideas about alchemy. So one has to keep in mind that Jung was not absolutely alone in these studies even though um, he did, did all the research on his own. And as I will show in uh, coming seminars, he spent a lot of time with the texts and created a kind of index or encyclopedia for himself uh, from the readings of the texts, um, out of which he would then create his works. Now, I just want to mention in passing some other Jungian literature on alchemy. Um, which um, members of the seminar might be interested in uh, pursuing. Um, not a great deal has been written on alchemy uh, by Jungian analysts and, uh, since uh, Jung's time, but a number of significant works. And it is a kind of thread or theme uh, within the Jungian world. Uh, some of the uh, terms of alchemy are very commonly used to describe uh, various conditions, mental states, psychological images, and uh, so on and so forth, processes. Um, and these, I hope, in the course of the seminar will also become very familiar to all of you. Uh, but I want to mention uh, a couple of, of the most important works that have been written by uh, Jungian analysts. Um, on alchemy, at least in, in the English language. Um, and um, I would say of all of them uh, that you see on this list, uh, probably the, 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 the one to be most highly recommended to begin the study of alchemy is von Franz's um, lectures published in 1980. They're actually lectures that she gave in 1959 at the Young Institute in Zurich called Alchemy, an Introduction to the Symbolism and the Psychology. And um, the thing about von Franz, as I said, is that she takes a quite a scholarly approach. She, in that work, uh, looks at a, at a text from uh, Greek um, and uh, Arabic and Latin sources. She sticks with the text. She gives a very um, uh, clear uh, exposition of the historical location of the text, its time and place, um, and, and uh, works with the um, uh, with the cultural um, uh, spirit of the times in which the text was created. The other thing about von Franz, uh, about her works in general, and this one in particular, is that she gives such interesting examples. She's very down to earth. She's very she can she can bring the alchemical texts, the the, the weird uh, recipes and and uh, expressions right into your own experience and uh, and tells stories and anecdotes and 
uh, about from her own experience and her work with patients. So she makes it very alive and very interesting uh, in a way that uh, Jung is more detached and more distant. Uh, he doesn't give that kind of uh, anecdotal material. Uh, Ron Franz is very free in doing that, and I think that really adds a great deal of uh, flesh to the um, sometimes somewhat dry bones of, uh, of what we have left of the alchemical tradition. Uh, the other text to mention I think is, is very uh, useful if you want to really go further into uh, the study of um, psychology and alchemy is Edward Edinger's book, 1985, The Anatomy of the Psyche, Alchem Alchemical Symbolism in Psychotherapy. And there he goes through a seven, um, seven uh, of the operations of the alchemists and builds his study of alchemy around these operations like sublimatio, sublimation, or calcinatio, the burning, uh, um, or solutio, the dissolving. And each chapter is devoted to one of these operations, and then he amplifies that uh, operation and shows how it is linked to psychological experience as he um, uh, has seen it uh, under his own in his own practice and in his own life. Um, the uh, Hillman um, wrote a number of essays, James Hillman, the um, contemporary, um, more, more recent uh, Jungian analyst who passed away about a year ago, wrote a number of essays that have now been collected in a volume called Alchemical Psychology. It's a collection of his papers um, that he uh, created over a period of a couple of decades on various alchemical themes. Um, and I was thinking about the difference between Hillman and Edinger, for instance, um, uh, and von Franz. Um, uh, Hillman, of course, knew these people, knew von Franz and Edinger, read Jung deeply, uh, was very familiar with all of that. But he really had his own style. And I would say if if you would say that von Franz and Edinger are classical, the classical music, uh, Hillman is jazz. He jazzes it up. He makes it more contemporary, more modern. He, his associations go out into the contemporary world um, in a way that von Franz's and Edinger's don't. Von Franz and Edinger stick to very classical materials, um, to uh, works like uh, um, Dante and Shakespeare and the Bible and uh, the Greek philosophers and, and so on, uh, medieval um, sources, as Jung did. Um, Jung sticks very much in his writings to the alchemist sources. He does not go out from there and uh, link uh, his work on alchemy to anything else that's going on in the contemporary world. Hillman, on the other hand, uh, is quite different in that he relates it to, uh, relates his um, reflections or using, uses alchemical images to talk about contemporary experience in film and art and architecture and what's going on in the modern world, politics and so on. So it's, uh, um, depend, depending on your taste, if you like jazz or classical music, um, you'll go for one or the other. I think they're both of value and they both have their own types of uh, followers. Um, and uh, for our seminar, I will be making some references to von Franz occasionally or to Edinger, but really mostly sticking to Jung himself. Maybe I should just uh, take a quick pause and see now if um, any questions have come in so far before I proceed. Uh, Len, uh, has anything come up? Not yet, Marie. Um, I'll check, but so far no questions have arisen. Okay, Can fine. Then I'll, I'll just go on. Perfect. Um, Murray, before you go on, could you try and... I'm um... now um, going to show you another slide. And I'm putting up here uh, a number of basic images and concepts that uh, and terms that uh, come up over and over again in Jung's writings. And I just want to put them out here. We'll be coming back to them 
many times in the course of the seminar, Marie? but you might just start um, taking note of them. Uh, many of them are Latin words. Of course, the alchemists that Jung studied mostly wrote in Latin, some in Greek. Uh, the ones that von Franz studied occasionally, she will look at an Arabic text uh, that's been translated, of course. But um, these uh, these are medieval Latin terms uh, that the alchemists used to describe various things that they saw or processes that they were engaged in or concepts they used. And um, I've made a list here. It is not not exhaustive, but I think uh, get some of the the um, uh, most important uh, uh, images and concepts. Under images, um, let me just go through these and mention um, something about them just very briefly because we'll be coming back to these over and over again. Uh, the vase is very important and I will talk about that a little later in relation to the text that was in the reading for today. Uh, that is the vessel, the container, um, which uh, was uh, an essential feature of the alchemical opus or work um, that uh, the material that was going to be processed was put into a vessel. And that vessel had, uh, had to be uh, a particular shape and size and, and uh, uh, strength and so on. And uh, there's, been, there's quite a lot of reflection about the vessel and the meaning of the vessel. And then the term prima materia uh, prima materia means prime material or prime matter. And that's the basic material that is gathered in order to begin the work. Um, now, uh, the recipes will tell you, the alchemical recipes will tell you what you have to gather, just as if you want to cook, uh, when you want to cook a meal, you go to a recipe book, it tells you what you need to put into the uh, into the stew or into the soup in order to, to create the um, uh, food that you want to eat, uh, want to prepare. The prima materia is uh, the um, uh, substance that will undergo the process of transformation. Now, when you take a psychological uh, interpretation of prima materia, um, as when Franz goes into it and, and Jung has a whole chapter on prima materia in volume 12, you realize that what, what we're talking about in psychology is uh, the psyche itself. The prima materia is the psyche. And um, so what your life has been to the point of, of the beginning of your alchemical work is what you put into the, into the vessel, into the container. Um, and it's important to get the right material in there um, because if you leave out some essential bits and pieces, you aren't going to get the result that you want or that, you, that is possible. And so finding the prima materia in the first place is a very important part of the work. Um, and von Franz has quite a lot to say about that in her book on alchemy. You have to get the the, the right emotional complexes. You have to get the uh, what's really at the core of your your uh, psychic being into that uh, 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 process, and that takes some searching and finding. Um, I remember Joe Wheelwright one time in a in a seminar raising the question, "What is your core complex?" That's what you want to get in there core complex. So it takes a while to find out what is your core complex. Is it, uh, for instance, an inferiority complex? Uh, or is it a, um, uh, a wish for paradise complex? Uh, are you a puer or a puella? You want to live in the paradisal world. That's your primary complex. Or is it a rebellion against your parents? Or is it a, um, a victim complex? So uh, it's important to, to get to the right uh, um, issues. That's the prima materia. You've got to get the prima materia into the vase, into the vessel, uh, and then start cooking it or working with it. Um, 
then you have these uh, three terms that I will speak about a little more in a moment, negredo, albedo, and rubedo. These are three Latin words meaning black, uh, white, and red. And these are stages of the work. The, the black stage is the stage of darkness, uh, often associated with depression, um, or uh, simply at a loss and confusion, in the dark, unconscious. Uh, and that's typically where one begins uh, the work. Albedo is the whitening, uh, when things uh, in the vessel turn from uh, black to white, that's associated psychologically with um, enlightenment or insight, uh, getting a glimmer of what's going on, what is the meaning, uh, perhaps seeing through the complex to the archetype, getting a, a glimpse of something deeper. And then the rubedo is the uh, rising of the sun. This goes from night to dawn to the rising of the sun and uh, the appearance of the sun in the rubedo, the reddening. And when the sun rises and the sun is shining, then you have uh, full-blown enlightenment. You have uh, the, all the properties of um, the um, uh, alchemical lapis, which is to uh, create warmth in the environment, to create growth, to um, provide uh, whatever is needed for the world around you to blossom and flourish. Um, and full consciousness. So that's Rubedo's state, and that's uh, the goal of the opus, to create or to get to the Rubedo. And these stages are not final. One goes uh, through them, over them, and over them many times, uh, from the Grado to Albedo to Rubedo. It's a it's movement toward enlightenment, you could say, from confusion and darkness through, aha, I see, to, yes, now I've... Uh, I can use what I've learned and I can really do something with it and it uh, warms me and it um, nourishes me and uh, and those around me. And then there's the term aqua permanence. Um, this is the permanent water. Um, this was a, a substance that the uh, alchemists referred to as a, a solvent, uh, but Aqua permanence has a kind of mystical quality to it. Also, it's a state, uh, a state of um, um, solid and permanent uh, um, uh, self-image and concept and sense of self. Um, and uh, we'll talk quite a bit more about this. So aqua permanence weaves in and out of these texts. It's, it's sometimes there at the beginning, sometimes it has the goal. It is a solvent, uh, but it's also a final product. And uh, uh, each of these terms has a number of um, uh, different uh, synonyms and um, sometimes quite confusing uh, references. The lapis is the stone. That's often uh, spoken of as the final goal of the alchemical work, to produce this stone, something very solid, something very um, uh, substantial, something you can stand on uh, and uh, doesn't uh, change. Uh, so the aqua permanence and the lapis can be equivalent. The term conjunctio is uh, a stage of the process that uh, uh, Edinger writes about an operation to bring together the opposites. And Jung speaks of this many times in his writings, especially the one on the transference uh, that we'll be looking at in one of our later sessions where the opposites come together, ma masculine, feminine, conscious, unconscious. And these, uh, this joining of the opposites is a very important uh, operation in the alchemical work. Uh, the rebus is the you know, product of the union of um, opposites. And it's the um, final statement of uh, integration of conscious and unconscious. Then, of course, there's the laboratory where the work is done, a uh, very important place, uh, connected to the vase, uh, a container. The laboratory contains 
uh, all the materials that are needed for the operations. The vase contains the material that are being operated upon. And so this um, uh, notion of contained space is very important. Um, and in psychology, of course, in psychotherapy, we think of the container of the relationship the, um, uh, and the um, setting, uh, the um, confidential nature of the relationship between an analyst and Melisande as a container, but also the building of a container within that can contain affect and impulse and uh, and and uh, work through issues, um, very important aspect or feature of uh, psychotherapeutic work. And this, of course, was essential also to the alchemical opus. And then you have these three elements, sol, sulfur, and mercurius. Uh, sol is salt, and it's associated with a feminine um, aspect of um, the alchemical operation. Sulfur is the masculine, the fiery, the aggressive. Sol is the uh, salty, the suffering, uh, but also the wise. Um, Jung has a long section on salt in his Mysterium Conjunctionis, very beautiful passages about the achievement of wisdom. And Mercurius is the middle term. Uh, he brings the sulfur and the salt together. This is Mercury. Uh, on the one hand, Mercury is the, the, uh, the uh, element, um, but Mercurius is the spirit of the whole work. He's there in the beginning, he's there in the end, he's there throughout. Uh, he brings the opposites together. Sometimes he creates mischief and trouble. Uh, sometimes he's the helpful spirit, the guiding spirit. Jung has a long essay on the spirit Mercurius. Um, in volume 13 of the Collected Works, published now, it was one of his Paranos papers, Spirit Mercurius as the Spirit of the Unconscious, and um, Spirit of the Psyche itself. And he's behind the whole operation. He's like the guiding spirit of the operation of alchemy. So these are some of the images that one um, encounters over and over again in Jung's writings on alchemy. And then there are these concepts uh, that we'll be speaking of. Uh, the opus is the work itself. Uh, alchemy is a work. It isn't, it isn't something that just happens on its own. It's something that uh, uh, must be engaged in deliberately and arduously and with a lot of energy. Um, and so we speak of um, individuation as an opus something that's done consciously, but with the cooperation of the unconscious, with the cooperation of the elements, and the work proceeds. Um, Deo concedente, as the alchemist would say, um, God, God conceding or God willing. Um, the, uh, uh, as, as a human individuation process goes also partly through synchronicity and, and um, through magical blessings on the one hand, but through also labor and suffering and hard work on the other. And then you have these two very important terms, which we will uh, speak about more next time, meditatio and ima imaginatio, um, meditation and imagination. And um, I'm going to just uh, leave those uh, very briefly uh, mentioned here because we're going to spend a good bit of time on them in the next seminar. And it's some of Jung's most important, interesting writing on um, the application of alchemy to the individuation process, meditation through meditation and imagination, and what he means by these terms and what the alchemists meant by these terms. Um, and then there's salve et coagulatio, that's dissolve and coagulate. Um, there is an operation that um, um, Edinger speaks of um, where um, uh, the um, material in the vessel has to be dissolved, turned into a liquid. And then there's the opposite movement of coagulating and turning the liquid into something solid. And this goes back and forth between um, dissolving and coagulating. 
Um, dissolving is done by liquid, by water. Coagulating is done by earth. The alchemists worked with four elements, um, earth, uh, water, air, and fire. And um, <clears throat> the uh, use of uh, um, earth is to make it down to earth, to, to make it solid. The, the use of water is to uh, dissolve what is hardened, what is rigid, what is, um, uh, uh, has been formed and shaped but needs to be changed. So we speak of com complexes as being hard and rigid and not wanting to uh, do anything but just repeat themselves over and over again and they need to be dissolved through analysis. So how to do that? And uh, uh, the application of um, various sometimes stringent or astringent uh, liquids to dissolve the complexes. Sometimes love dissolves a complex. Sometimes compassion dissolves a complex. Um, uh, sometimes anger uh, can dissolve the complex. Um, um, break through and take it apart. Uh, and then uh, moving into the coagulatio is um, making something that has been floating, that has been uh, um, uh, in a uh, dissolved form solid, uh, so that you have something to stand on, something to hold, um, an insight that doesn't float around and uh, can't be used but uh, to bring uh, some ground under one's feet, to take a position, to take a stand. So um, uh, earth is needed, bringing it down to earth. And von Franz is so good at that in her writings to coagulate, to, to bring things down to earth by giving a, a concrete example of it. And then circulatio is uh, the circulation going um, uh, through a process many times over and over again, circulating through it. And you can see in some of the operations that the um, uh, process is repeated many times. It goes, uh, uh, one hopes, in a spiral movement toward uh, something better and not just a simple repetition. But sometimes it has to circulate through the alchemical vessels, go from bottom to top and back down to bottom over and over again through a circulation process, kind of distillation process, brewing uh, process, um, and refining through the circulation, refining, making something more conscious, making something more precise and specific. And then, of course, the term transformation, transformatio, is, is uh, what the whole operation is about, what alchemy is all about, to transform uh, substances from, let's say, from lead to gold. But the transformation isn't the same exactly as change, changing from one thing to another. It means drawing something out of what was there all along and bringing it out more, giving it more expression, giving it more conscious formation. And um, so it's, it's moving uh, structures and possibilities and dynamics and energies from one side from, from the unconscious side, from a potential side into consciousness. And, um, and in the process, a, a structure forms, an identity forms, um, a personality takes shape. And this transformation, moving from potential to actualization, is the movement from the prima materia to the lapis or to the, or to the um, what they called our gold, uh, a kind of spiritual gold, a, a sense of value, and um, um, a permanent value. Uh, so transformation is, is not to change a person into something else. It's to bring out what the person has been all along. And that includes, and this is where um, alchemy departs from spiritual traditions as such, or the Christian uh, spiritual tradition at least, which is a, a movement toward perfection, getting rid of evil, getting rid of the shadow, repressing it, um, 
pushing it away. Alchemy isn't about that. It's about including it. It comes with. Nothing is left behind. Um, and this inclusion of the shadow and of um, aspects of the human personality that are not ideal from a spiritual perspective uh, is one of the things that really attracted Jung to alchemy, that he felt that uh, the spiritual traditions as, as they've been practiced in the West, um, maybe not, not uh, identical to, to some of the Eastern practices, have been too focused on pure spirituality, uh, leaving out the earth, leaving out instinct, leaving out the body. Um, and uh, what interested him in uh, about alchemy was that it worked with materials and it worked in materials. It didn't leave the material world behind. It didn't, it didn't rise above the material world into a a metaphysical world or into a purely spiritual world, it transformed this world. And so uh, one of the criticisms that's been made by philosophers and, and theologians of other traditions of Christianity is that it lives too much in the other world. Um, now, there are certainly forms of Christianity that don't, that, that really do, do want to transform this world as well as, much, as best we can. Uh, but the notion of transformation, I think, in alchemy is something, and, and for as, as Jung used that term, is something really to try to understand deeply, that it is not a drive for perfection, for spiritual perfection. It's a drive for wholeness, and that is inclusive uh, of uh, the material and the shadow, and as, as well as the high spiritual and cognitive and and so on, uh, parts of ourselves. And then this term lithos u lithos, that's a Greek word, uh, the stone that's not a stone. And this is a, a very interesting concept that uh, brings us to the symbolic nature of alchemy. As Jung understand, understood alchemy, it wasn't really only about chemical processes of turning lead into gold and so on. Uh, and I'm just reading from paragraph 342, of volume 12 now. The alchemical op opus deals in the main not just with chemical experiments as such, but with something resembling psychic processes express expressed in pseudo-chemical language. Uh, these psychic processes expressed in pseudo-chemical language, in other words, the language of chemistry, the language as it was known at that time, the language of, of the material uh, materials that were brought into the alchemist's laboratory and the processes are metaphors for a psychological process. So the lithus or lithus that the alchemists referred to, or the gold that, that's the, our gold, uh, uh, is a uh, an awareness on their part that they're producing something that isn't uh, in the uh, uh, physical laboratory, it's in the psychic laboratory. So lithos or lithos is a psychic stone, a psychic base, a psychic uh, achievement and acquisition. Um, and the stone that perhaps they would hold, maybe a piece of gold or something that had the incredible ability, as they said, to project its healing uh, powers and its uh, capacities for fructification and for um, uh, multiplication. Uh, use this piece of gold, you touch anything, it turns to gold. So on. It, uh, these are metaphors for the um, influence that people who have gone through uh, an alchemical psychological process have on other people. They can project good things into other people. They can make the world around them uh, flourish. And so um, it's, we're talking about a psychological stone, symbolic stone, that is a, uh, an acquisition, a possession of the individual, the personality that has um, uh, individuated 
individuated personality, a conscious personality, is a high achievement. And this is recognized in all the religious traditions that have the notion of individuation somehow sequestered within their, uh, within their practices. Um, Jung felt that was very weak in the Christianity that he knew, that there wasn't enough of awareness of an individuation process, that it needed more um, grounding in process. And the problem was that if, with Christianity, theology, Christian theology, as Jung saw it, was that it relied too much on one person's individuation process. One person had individuated, namely Jesus of Nazareth became the Christ, so that nobody else had to. And so everybody else is passive and receives the benefits from that one. And Jung thought that's not good enough. Everybody should individuate. We should all imitate Christ in the sense of being individuating human beings. And the alchemical process is a way of talking about that, uh, becoming a personality, becoming a developed personality. And it's something that goes on throughout life um, as long as you live. There's, there's no um, final term, uh, term, termination point or terminal point of the individuation process in this lifetime. Then the Jungian psychological terms that are used in reference to all of this, I've mentioned already, psyche. The psyche is the prima materia. That's what we work with. The individuation process is the opus. It's the unfolding and, and all the operations and, and uh, stages of the process. Uh, projection, which we'll talk about in a moment, is um, seeing um, the psyche in an object, seeing the psyche in the world around you, and recognizing that as a projection. Participatio mystique is a term that Jung uses quite often. It's identification with the object in the, in the, in the flask or in the, in the uh, alchemical laboratory. Uh, or in the world around you, other people, or your culture, or whatever your participation mystique is an unconscious identification with the object world around you. And then the term wholeness, which I talked about as the goal of the transformation process, and the self, which is a term to describe the psyche as a whole. So um, this is introductory to our uh, studies as they uh, come along. These are terms and concepts, images that are going to occur over and over again uh, as we proceed. In the next picture, I show you uh, an image that I found on the internet uh, for, uh, of the opus. And uh, the opus is the work. And here you see a picture of the alchemist laboratory. Now it's very messy. You see all the different tools he's got there. It's kind of a funny picture. And there Murray, are two can you people hear me? working there toward, toward the right. There's a, a vase, a vessel. Uh, there are all these instruments on the table. Uh, and there's a fire going on in the furnace over there and the alchemist puffing and up. Sometimes they were called uh, puffers because they would blow air onto the fire to make it a little stronger. Uh, kind of a humorous picture of the laboratory and where the opus is going on. Now, I think we have to recognize that most of our lives look like this. Uh, you know, the, 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 where the opus goes on in our psyche is not such a clean place. It's not tidy. It's full of all kinds of stuff, memories and complexes and instruments and uh, uh, passions and whatnot. Uh, and we try to uh, work with all that to see if we can produce a lapis, produce the lapis from it. Now here you see Jung the old alchemist at Bollingen working on his stone. Jung loved to work in concrete materials, with materials. I was once out at Bollingen with his grandson Ulrich Herney and um, Bollingen is, is the tower uh, that Jung built out on the upper part of Lake Zurich. And he, um, uh, it's made of stone, all of stone. And Ulrich Herney, who looks quite a bit like his grandfather, put his hand on the stone and he said, Jung loved to touch the stone. He had big hands and he loved to just put his hand on the stone. 
So here you see a picture of Jung uh, carving stone at Bollingen, a pipe in his mouth as always, and in a workman's outfit. Um, and so it's, it's Jung uh, working on uh, his own individuation process. He said that Bollingen represented the self for him. Uh, it was a symbolic house that he put up in stages over a period of many years. And he did it by hand, and it was hands-on. And he loved to work uh, with uh, materials, uh, grew his own potatoes, cooked his own food, so on and so forth. So that was a kind of expression of the alchemist in Jung, as he uh, worked on himself in various different ways. The Red Book was one phase. It was his midlife transition phase, midlife transformation process. And then after that, he took up Bollingen and alchemy, and he continued working all his life. And his artwork really was an extension of his inner work. And so inner and outer um, come together in Bollingen, uh, in Jung's creations there. Now here you see an alchemist looking into the flask, and he's projecting. Um, you can see he's gazing very intently. Uh, he's got a fire going under the flask. He's blow, blowing some air on the fire. And there's a little figure inside the flask. Uh, well, that little figure is probably uh, Hermes, or you know, it's, uh, it's what he sees in there. And the alchemist would see the most amazing things in their flasks. They would see lions swallowing the sun. They would see uh, sun and moon. They would see conjunctio images. I'll show you some of those. And here it's a little figure um, that is the, probably Mercurius, the spirit of the work. And the alchemist uh, seeing himself, in a sense, in the flask. He's projecting. So Jung speaks a lot about alchemy as a process of projecting the psyche into the material world. And as long as it's being uh, seen in the material world, when Franz says this very boldly, as long as you are convinced that it's true, you really see it out there, it's not yet, you can't yet speak of a projection. You really see it there. The alchemists really saw these things in their flask. Von Franz says, it's only when you begin to question it, is it really there, or am I imagining it's there, that you begin to speak of projection. And from the outside, of course, we can see clearly that it's projection. But the alchemist wouldn't accept that. He would say, no, no, it's really in there. And so the, the, the process is so convincing, as it is in our lives, too. We always believe our perceptions are true. Uh, until we step back a little bit and wonder, did, am, am I imagining that? Did I really uh, see what I thought I saw or hear what I thought I heard? Or am I making it up somehow? And then we begin realizing, oh, if the object doesn't quite conform to what we thought it was, we begin having a doubt. And um, this often happens if you idealize somebody and then you get closer to them and you realize they aren't what you thought they were, or some other parts, then you begin understanding, oh, that was a projection. And then it comes in, and uh, the work, the inner work begins, then you begin realizing these are figures of, of the psyche that you've put into the object world. Now here's, again, a picture of projection. You see a lion, you see a woman's face, some bodies, some uh, look like animals, horse and so on, a figure, man's figure, a bearded figure on the left. All of this in the vessel. Uh, so again, it's a projective process. And if you identify with it, uh, you feel it. If you uh, have a, a projective identification with that little figure in, the, in there who's maybe getting pretty hot and screaming, you start feeling fire in your belly and you start getting a stomach ache. Uh, that's projective identification that you are intimately connected with that object. And what affects it will affect you as well. So there you have that. And then the transformation process of turning one type of material through a slow period of time, drawing out its potential, finding the value in the lead, turning it into gold, 
through the process of transformation. And here you see a furnace and a, a vessel, again, heat applied. And you see that um, we'll speak about this uh, in a later seminar, that uh, the heat uh, uh, separates the liquid from um, the other material. The liquid rises in the form of droplets and steam, rises to the top, condenses, and then floats down that little uh, connecting link to another vessel. Um, and uh, this is a process of distillation, so or purification. And then it might repeat and go through the same process again. And here is the vase. Now, before I go into the vase in the rest of the seminar, I want to spend a little time on that. Uh, let me just take a short break and see when have there been any questions till now? Hey, Murray, can you hear me? Thank you, Murray. Can, can you hear me at this moment? Yes. Murray, if you would do us a favor, we think it would be better, especially with these images. On your screen at the top, you'll see on the menu bar a little green button that says play. Yes. If you can click on that, we believe there'll be a way for you to share your screen in, in full screen mode so that the images will be even more present. I think you've done it. Yeah. We do have a, a number of questions, so if you don't mind, Marie, let me just go ahead and pose some of those. Um, I'll start with one that came in quite a bit ago, but um, let me see if I can get all the way to the beginning. Here it is. Can you give any pointers on getting out of the Western mindset in order to take in the concepts of the alchemists? And then going on explaining, i.e., how do we forget cogito ergo sum, or how can we suspend our disbelief? Do you have any suggestions for how you might be able to get out of our Western minds traditions? Well, I don't think we, um, I don't think we can get out of them. I think we have to um, live with them. And um, uh, uh, have our own experiences because um, I mean we can interpret these experiences of the alchemists we can look at them we uh, actually there are people who still perform some of these alchemical operations and uh, still believe that uh, this kind of uh, physical transformation of substances is, is possible through using some of the recipes but um, I don't think we want to go there we don't want to go to a, a pre uh, scientific or pre-modern um, mentality. I think we have to move forward into a postmodern mentality, and that is to um, learn to read metaphors and symbols as um, saying something uh, about the um, reality of the psyche. Um, and and I think that is uh, a very difficult thing for us to do. To to kind of uh, live with the paradox that um, the object is a real object, but it also um, has a symbolic uh, dimension to it. And not all objects do for everybody, uh, but um, I think to develop a symbolic sense, um, which is a, a sense for metaphors, but in a strong sense of metaphor. Uh, and um, to uh, realize that uh, the world we live in uh, is not the medieval world, but it is also a world in which um, there are opportunities for um, symbolic experience and for developing a symbolic imagination. Uh, I'm going to talk more about that next time in relation to imaginatio and, and meditatio. I think there are ways of training ourselves to um, uh, think symbolically, and I think psychology is a very useful part of that. I, um, at least that's been my experience, that for me, um, learning Jungian psychology and the basics of uh, understanding what the psyche is, the world of the archetypes and complexes and so on, um, and how it operates through projection and um, introjection and, and the individuation process, understanding those uh, 
gives one a way of um, interpreting experience uh, and seeing the symbolic value of of um, of the object world. You know, objects can be alive. They can have uh, deep resonance with your psyche. That your psyche and the object world uh, really um, are connected. Uh, and what I think you're what you're referring to in that question is trying to overcome the Cartesian split between subject and object and realize that we live in one world, uh, the unio, um, the uh, unus mundus. Um, and I think we can get there, but it wouldn't be by getting out of our mindset, it would be by, in a way, going beyond it and bringing it with us. Um, so, um, uh, let me interject. We are modern. I don't think if 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 you've if you've gone through a, a fairly serious educational process, uh, it does shape and change your mind and and conditions you. And I don't think you can you can put that away. I think you have to work on going uh, going beyond it. And I would suggest depth psychology is one way to do that. A very good way to do that, um, and to um, enter into a mindfulness of um, the uh, unity of the world and, and, the, and the oneness of the psyche in the world and in, in oneself. Um, and I think the alchemists, um, in their own way, uh, and pre-modern men and women in their own way, uh, had this, uh, um, it was easier for them than it is for us. Um, Franz and Jung often write about uh, primitive mentality, as they call it, the primitive, the world that the primitive person lives in. They don't just mean other people, uh, you know, living in non-industrialized uh, countries and so on. But the primitive anywhere is the is the person who uh, doesn't make any distinctions between his or her thoughts and the world around them, the feelings are out there and in there, the world is all kind of mixed together and um, unified and symbols aren't taken as symbolic, they're taken as real. It's a kind of pre-psychological uh, pre consciousness. But we don't have that. We, uh, we, that, that, that's a kind of paradisal state that isn't accessible to us anymore. And by going postmodern uh, or going past the modern into the psychological, which I think is uh, of as postmodern, um, is a way of bringing the modern along with us as we try to uh, perceive in, in a new way the unity of the world. Some, and some people have used physics, quantum physics, to do that, or um, uh, uh, various mystical traditions. But I think psychology is a very good way to go. And, right. uh, you know, if I could just um, very ask. useful for uh, regaining a sense of the symbolic in a, in a very uh, effective, profound way. Well, thanks one, for the question. Maybe I'll, uh, one, I'll one just. Thought, Marie, with, yeah. regard, with regard to the um, that primitive man is, I suppose if we esteem that transcending of our Western mind and the recapturing of that more mythic and um, primal mind, I suppose the, the primitive man doesn't get the blessing of even having that option. Um, but maybe that compensates for the encumbrance that we have. We had another question that was uh, pertaining to, let me just read the question and the follow-up that came with it. Can you comment on the correspondence between the four stages of analysis and the stages of the alchemical process. And then with that came a, a question for a comment. For example, the prima materia, is, in, is that in the confessional stage of an analysis? Can it be likened to that? Um, I've always had a difficulty with stages of analysis because uh, it doesn't seem so clear cut to me. Um, but I think. Um, uh, I like that uh, linkage between uh, gathering the prima materia and the confessional uh, 
aspect rather than stage maybe because it it extends throughout the analysis the confessions are being made all the time sometimes uh, the confession that's made at the beginning isn't the real confession that needs to be made and the person doesn't know what the real confession is until much later when you really get down to the core issues and um, experiences uh, do you discover what the core confession uh, or what the confession should be but I think uh, to to get to the prima materia yeah confession in the sense of really being becoming conscious of the, the basic flaw or the, the fundamental issue um, and bringing that out into the open uh, the um, you know the religious traditions have this um, feature of confession uh, the Catholic Church especially you know the confessional in the Jewish tradition the Day of Atonement Yom Kippur where you reflect on what is uh, to be confessed and of course a lot of people would go to, to the confessional booth and just rattle off stuff that they knew the priest wanted to hear a sort of conventional confessions that they half believed in or half didn't but just to get through the through the process but to do a deep reflection on what should be confessed is an analytic uh, procedure and um, I've spent many many sessions with people trying to get to uh, the point where that can be put into words. I mean, uh, and then you have the prima materia, and then that is what has to be worked with. Now, the, as for the other three stages of analysis, elucidation, education, and, and transformation, I think the transformation stage would, would correspond to the alchemical opus in that there is a, um, a process afoot in the um, relationship between the analyst and the, uh, and the analysand that uh, has a, a transformative effect on both of them, as Jung writes about it in that essay. And, this, uh, and the outcome of that is undetermined at the beginning. You don't know how that's going to come out. Um, when I've entered into those kinds of situations with patients over the years, I've been enormously surprised at what it's turned into, at, at what what is possible. Uh, and there you really see the lead turning into gold. It's, it's quite amazing and astonishing to see uh, what kinds of um, amazing and um, um, surprising gifts and uh, capacities come out of an unconscious that's been been blocked by complexes, by anger, by wounds, by by um, traumas, uh, and when that is allowed to emerge, it transforms everything in the room, um, and is a, a what Jung really uh, equates with the with the alchemical opus, when the, the prima materia goes through the stages of Negredo, Albedo, Rubedo, and you get to that final product of um, the, the glowing, uh, I have a picture of that here somewhere, the Rubedo, there's the vessel, uh, Negredo, Negredo, Circulatio, Albedo. Now you have Rubedo in the vessel. Uh, you see that red in the vessel and at the bottom here coming down the red material and uh, that's the way the, the alchemists um, uh, painted it or, or imagined it in that uh, rubedo um, liquid there is um, you know the capacity for transformation of other objects of, of uh, what they call projectio projecting the warmth and the heat and the value into others and when that's in the room uh, in that fourth stage of the uh, of the analytic process, when that's in the room, everything is healed. Everything gets warm. Everybody is happy and joyful, <laughs> and <laughs> you feel you've arrived. Uh, now, we also know that doesn't last forever, and we go back again to circulatio, and you sometimes you have to start over again, 
and just maybe you start with a different complex and you start with a different confession and you start with a uh, a different uh, side of the personality uh, that uh, will then go through the uh, similar procedures and come out into the rebedo stage. Um, but uh, I, I would say of those four, the confession and the transformation are the, the most linked to the alchemical process. The other two, elucidation, I don't think the alchemists did very much interpreting uh, in, in the we do some in Jungian work, we do some interpreting, but not in the, in the way Freudians interpret or Kleinians uh, interpret, but uh, a kind of um, interpretation that tries to link um, various images and uh, features of the personality, yes, and past and present. Um, we do some of that in education, of course, too, what, the, what some symbols might mean uh, in a general sense, amplification and so on, uh, sometimes reading books or going to the movies and seeing something that is relevant or related to a dream or to an experience. That's the educational aspect, um, but um, confession and uh, transformation, certainly. Murray, I'll ask one more question only because I think it will be a brief one just for clarity. We have a lot of other, a lot of other questions that I could choose from. But is it fair to say that the Voss is the body? And then we can perhaps return. Oh, to the... I'm glad you came to the Voss because I, that's what I—that's where I want to conclude this. And I want to refer you to uh, some very interesting passages in the reading for today um, that um, occur. Uh, paragraph 338, in particular. Um, where uh, Jung says that the um, for the alchemist the vessel is something truly marvelous, a vase mirabile, uh, a miraculous vessel. Maria Prophetessa says that the whole secret lies in knowing about the hermetic vessel. Unum est vas, the vessel is one, is emphasized again and again. It must be completely round in imitation of the spherical cosmos, so that the influence of the stars may contribute to the success of the operation. It is a kind of matrix or uterus from which the Filius Philosophorum, that's the, the child of the philosophers, that little figure that we saw in the vessel earlier, the miraculous stone is to be born. Hence it is required that the vessel be not only round but egg-shaped. Now, if you think psychologically, what is the vessel? The question was, is it the body? Could be the body uh, is certainly a part of it, the body as a, a vessel of the psyche. Um, but you can think about this vessel in, in several different ways. And I think I would like everybody to take away from the seminar uh, the notion of the importance of the vessel. The vessel is the container for the operation. Now, what contains the psychological operation of individuation? Um, we speak of the of the um, analytic um, frame as a vas bene clausum, a well-sealed vessel because of its confidentiality and its um, privacy and, uh, can, and sealed off from the rest of the world, uh, at, at least to, to a significant extent. So sometimes the vessel can be looked on as, as a very, um, a, a very uh, open and intimate and personal relationship. That's a, a vessel. But it has to be a vessel in which there is absolute trust. Uh, that is, the, the glass has to be strong enough to hold the outside out and the inside in. And so um, uh, uh, very intense relationships uh, can be seen as a, a, as a container for the process. We'll talk a lot more about that in another session. But I would also like to emphasize the, um, or, or bring out the, the vessel as a container as, a, as the containment capacity of the ego. Um, the ego is uh, and a very important feature of the psyche and sometimes denigrated and put, and put down as being, you know, the narcissistic piece and the I, I, I and me, me, me and all that. But it's a lot more than that. Uh, the ego is um, uh, the, the the central governing, uh, um, the captain, if you will, of the 
of the process, um, uh, of, the, of the conscious aspects of the process at least. And a strong ego, as we talk about it in, in psychology, is a, is a strong vessel. It is the capacity to contain. Um, and I think uh, a good psychotherapy and analysis builds this vessel in the patient. Uh, in addition to holding it out as a, as a container uh, in the relationship, builds the capacity to contain strong emotions, not to act out, to contain and reflect, to process before before acting, to um, contain emotion, to contain uh, impulse, um, to contain a very dark um, uh, and passionate uh, um, affects, envy, greed, um, uh, desire for revenge, all of that um, is a part is the prima materia also. And that has to be brought in, but it has to be contained. If it's acted out, the whole operation explodes and you have to start over again. And that happens over and over again in the alchemical literature that it blows up. Uh, it, it, there's too much heat, the container isn't strong enough, the laboratory explodes. Um, and some analyses go like that too, that the, that the uh, emotions that are unleashed in the relationship are not containable by the, the people who are involved, one side or both. Uh, and so this uh, capacity to contain the psyche uh, as an ego capacity, um, I think is uh, one of the most valuable products of, um, and not only a product, but a condition for individuation. It's a product of individuation, but it's also a condition for individuation. And that's the paradox you come to over and over again. Uh, it has to be there in the beginning and it's there in the end. And you can't start without the gold and the gold doesn't appear until the end and so on. Uh, Mercurius is the beginning, the middle, and the end. Uh, and so is the vessel. And so it's often said, you know, of some patients, well, they're not analyzable. They, they don't have the capacity to go through this process. And Jungians are a little more generous with that judgment uh, or, or, or let's say conservative with that judgment than some other therapists. They're more willing to take the risk sometimes with patients that don't look too promising at the outset. But um, if a, a person has no capacity for containment, they really can't do a, a transformation process in the sense that we're talking about it. You have to be able to contain in order to make the material conscious, in order to bring it up and in, into the light of day to go through these stages from the greater to albedo to albedo, uh, to become conscious of what's really at the heart of it. And again, I would refer you to this book by Van Franz on alchemy. She gives a number of wonderful examples of, of that um, process of making the, uh, bringing the, bringing the process to the level where what starts out looking like rage or envy or greed turns out to be um, golden. Uh, the, the, um, the, the, at bottom, uh, linking to the self, linking to an experience of God, a wish for God, a wish for mystical experience. It's like what Jung said about uh, the alcoholic, you know, it's, it's a misplaced drive for spirituality. He's looking for the spirit, but in the wrong place. Uh, and if you can take the alcoholism and turn it into the drive for a higher spirituality, you might get an extraordinary development. But the alcoholism, the, 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 the addiction has to be contained or it just keeps on going in the same old way until you hit bottom and either go into AA at that point or you crash and die. But um, uh, So the vessel as Maria Prophetisa said, is everything, um, the vas mirabile. And it is one of the unique human capacities to contain. I don't think animals, at least most animals to my knowledge, 
have much capacity unless at least the pets I've had have very little capacity to contain. If they feel it, they express it, they do it. If they are hot, they, they do it. If they're cold, they, they do it. They, if they're hungry, they eat and so on and so forth. They're much more controlled by instincts and drives than we have to be. We also are animals and mammals and have our basic human needs and instinctual um, drives and wishes. But we do have this extraordinary capacity to create an alchemical individuation process out of that very material, out of the same material uh, that otherwise would just be a, a kind of chaos, a, a, a mixture of this and that and drives and impulses and um, emotions. So I think we've managed to use up our time for this session, haven't we, Lynn? We have indeed, Marie. I don't know if you, um, we've already announced to everybody in attendance that our time is up if they wanted to drop off. If you wanted to finish any of the presentation, you can feel free to do so and we'll record it, but that's entirely up to you. Well, I think, um, I think I've done the main points. I just want to leave you with one picture at the end, which is, if I can roll it out here, um, there. And this is a, a painting by Jackson Pollock. Uh, Jackson Pollock, a modern painter, uh, was in analysis with Joseph Henderson in the 1940s. And uh, it might have been under the influence of Joseph Henderson that he painted this painting. I don't know that for a fact, but I found this on the internet. And um, it looks like a, a very good rendition of Prima Materia to me. I mean, there's a lot in there. It's a massa confusa, as the alchemists would say. Uh, uh, a, ma a confused mass of materials, and yet it uh, it has a certain geometry to it. It has a fascination. It looks like it has a lot of potential for development. I see some threads of gold in there. There's lots of black and bits of red. So um, uh, I leave you with that as um, as a modern image of uh, an alchemical um, picture. And uh, hope that uh, you, uh, in doing the uh, readings and study for the seminar as we go along, um, will get the feeling for what uh, the alchemical process is, uh, as Jung understood it, because it really does very much relate to uh, the individuation process. And it's his way of linking our modern um, individuation attempts to the, the past and the deep past. And uh, I find it very rich to study and read uh, Jung's alchemical work. So I will leave you with that. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you very much, Marie. One, one word just to the in, uh, entire audience in attendance. Um, a question arose as to whether we might receive a PDF of the readings. I don't know about whether all the reading material itself will be able to be available with, by PDF, but Perhaps if we haven't already done so, we'll try and make a deliberate effort to post where the what the reading material might be that you could um, review in advance of the next conference. That would be helpful. I don't know if everybody realized when you were quoting from paragraph 338, that was from volume 12. But in case you didn't realize, that was that was volume 12 that Marie was referring to. And just so that you might see, here's a few of the different. Um, titles that Murray, Murray was referring to. One of them is, this is von Franz's Alchemical Act of Imagination. That wasn't on the list, but it's another of hers. Um, here is at least one copy of von Franz's uh, title of Alchemy. And then Murray had also made reference to Anatomy of the Psyche by Edinger. So, uh, but we'll try and make a list available to you. Again, thank you so much, Murray, for the presentation. and. As we mentioned before, this is the first in that series of five lectures. Bear in mind, next Saturday there will be a conference originating from Chicago, and that will be on the 15th, and it begins at 11 rather than um, at noon. And I'm not certain I remember the date of our next conference, Marie. Um, if you wait a moment, I've got it right here. The March conference needed to be rescheduled, and it will now be held on April 5th. Perfect. So April 5th, and you'll be receiving an announcement. Remember as well that you'll receive a survey 
online to fill out. We appreciate those who do that. It helps us to um, make improvements and be mindful of your needs. So once again, Murray, thank you so much for this presentation and we'll convene again uh, next Saturday. Goodbye now. Bye. Bye.